most important thing here is to make sure that you're not adding or dropping carbons. Uh, it looks like uh, you might have used numbers to make sure you weren't adding or dropping carbons. So uh, that was good if that uh, helped you here. I think you guys uh, got that. Uh, here's your final product. driving force for uh, this step? How, do, how are we able to kick off this poor leading group? Because the final product is stable. Yeah. Right. Stable because it's reformed the carbonyl and we've deprotonated this alpha carbon. This is another 1,3-dicarbonyl that we made over here. By the way, notice here how we used a solvent that is just a protonated form of the base. This is a good thing to do. That way we don't have to worry about these competing with each other. We want to use a solvent that's just a protonated form of the base, therefore we don't, we don't have to worry about competition. Also, notice that, um, what type of L group do we have here? This is an ethyl, right? ETO. Well, notice how that matches the base. That's something else you want to do. That way, again, you don't have to worry about competition, because what's the other thing that this could do besides deprotonation? The other thing this could do, right. But we don't need to worry about that here, because even if it does act like a nucleophile and replace the L group, it'll give you the same L group as before. So those are two important points. In the Clayson condensation, you want to use a base that matches the original L group. You want to use a base that matches the original L group so that you don't accidentally end up replacing the L group, because that's not what we're trying to do. And you want to use a solvent that matches the base, just the protonated form, so you don't need to worry about those competing with each other. For me, if I put in the asterisks and the alpha, it helps me to get all the carbons connected right. Uh, but I saw that one of you also put in some numbers. So if this is all confusing, you can use numbering to make sure that you're getting the carbons right. Also, I I'm still trying to follow this pattern. It really helps me to follow what I'm doing to put everything in these positions here. Um, especially, this is the most confusing picture right here. This is where people forget what's happening. So I put, this is the nucleophile that attacked, and here's the L group that's going to be leaving. So I'm making this pattern match that one up there. So what would be a good base to use here for a place in condensation? Well, I'm not even doing place in condensation because it's not enough H's. Let's see. Let's check. Which one? The oh, the alpha. Yeah. Oh, same ethyl. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what would be a good solvent? And now, going back to the comment you made earlier, here's where I find it so helpful to actually physically label the alpha carbon. If you actually physically label the alpha carbon, you can see this is the carbon we're focusing on, and it does have enough hydrogens. The beta carbon only has one hydrogen, but that doesn't matter here. The alpha carbon has two hydrogens, which is the minimum that we need. So it's really helpful to actually physically put in that alpha symbol. All right, now this time, I forbid you to draw the mechanism. Uh, just try to draw the product. See if you can draw, because it's good to know the mechanism, but you might have to do a problem where you have to do three or four placing condensations in a row, and you can't draw the mechanism every single time. So it's important to be able to get the right product without the mechanism. So there should just be one more picture, basically, of the final product.
The easiest way for me to do this is to follow this pattern here. So, and to use the redraw and modify technique. So let's say that this is the carbonyl carbon that's acting like the electrophile. So I put the asterisk in here. Now I know that what's going to happen here is this leaving group is going to leave. The leaving group is going to leave and replaced by the nucleophile. So I'm simply going to erase this L group and put in the nucleophile over here. Now, who's the nucleophilic atom? It's the alpha carbon. So the first thing I do is I just put in this carbon and label it as alpha. I'm not worried about the whole molecule. I'll just say, this is the alpha carbon. All right, and then I ask, what is the, what is the alpha carbon connected to? Well, one thing it's connected to is this isopropyl group. So I put in the isopropyl group. And the other thing the alpha carbon is connected to is a carbonyl. And then the O and the ethyl. I think this matches what both of you guys got. Uh, it's, you have to be very careful to make sure everything's in the right position. It's kind of confusing, because if two pictures are oriented different, it's hard to tell if they're the same, but I think both of you got this. So for me, this is the quickest and most reliable way to do it. I start by just redrawing the original electrophilic molecule, then I erase the L group, and I replace it with the nucleophile, and I start by just drawing the alpha carbon, and then I ask what's the alpha carbon connected to. If this was at all difficult for me, I would also put in numbers, so I was making sure everything was connected well. But in this case, just putting in the alpha and the asterisks made things a lot clearer to me. And at this point, if I said this was the final product, I would not get full credit, because I didn't do what you guys did. You both remembered we have to deprotonate the alpha carbon here. We're not showing the mechanism, but it's a 1,3-dicarbonyl. Um, and uh, I think you both, um, you might have left out one other thing, because there's another product. HOC. Yeah, maybe you did write that down. But, uh, I didn't write it down, but I thought, like, why do we need to write it down if that's just a solvent? Ah, yeah. Well, I guess it depends on what the instructor asks you for. But if they said something like, draw all organic products, which is pretty common here, we've got to include this, because this is an organic product. Usually we don't draw leaving groups because they're just inorganic things like halogens. But they're more, um, also th this is more interesting because it did the last deprotonation. So you're more likely in this case than usual for the instructor to want you to draw this, even though this is probably what we're mainly interested in. Okay, this is a pretty complicated reaction, but I think we picked this up um, quite quickly here. Now this reaction can only work under basic conditions. Why would it not make sense to do a Clayson condensation under acidic conditions? We need it to become an enolate. Right, that's the same reason why the aldol condensation only works under basic conditions, because that's, uh, you also need to enolate there. So we've seen the aldol condensation is when an enolate attacks an aldehyde or a ketone. Well, now we've seen what happens when an enolate attacks an ester. We get this place in the condensation. And we've learned how to do it with or without the mechanism. So now we got it. So now we know how to make 1,3-dicarbonyls. And the rest of the chapter is about what you can do with 1,3-dicarbonyls. So should we move on to that? OK. Although we've already seen one thing you can do with 1,3-dicarbonyls. The main thing you can do with 1,3-dicarbonyls is deprotonate the alpha carbon between the two carbonyls. That's what the whole basis of the rest of the chapter is. So when you're practicing the Clayson condensation, remember to practice it both ways. Practice the mechanism, but also do some problems where you just practice drawing the product without the mechanism, like we just went through, and make sure that all the carbons are in the right place. 